takeaways from my session on Friday. I thought Friday was a pretty good session because uh, not only I was able to have some winning trades, but uh, I guess this is kind of just to reinforce the good behaviors that I took, uh, the good behaviors that I went after, the thought processes, thought processes. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. Friday, August 18th, before we started, the value was uh, 98.28, which had the drawdown at about 3.28. So to recap, right, I'm doing a 10K eval evaluation, uh, the smallest eval available on a trade day. Funny, why not go bigger? Why not? The idea is that if you can manage 10K, you can manage 100K. You manage 100K, you can... It, the number doesn't fucking matter as long as you're managing and you go about it like you do it you just fucking do it like if you can manage 10k if you can manage any amount you should be able to manage 100 the number shouldn't fucking matter just get it so in this process in this challenge evaluation i have to get to a thousand dollars profit which is what 10 percent on a 10k if you can come back and get 10 percent on any amount that's great right because i mean right now spies are turning fucking i don't fucking know negative over the last one or so months but yeah anyways fucking going on tangent. we have three trades and one loss puts my win record and my win percentage on the day about 66 67 um we took what 120 pnl which is about 1.22 percent on the day which is pretty good but i think it's important to realize that it should be measured by risk so i risk more or less 25 dollars or on the q's not the q's but the mnq about uh, 15 not 15 12 and a half points per trade but technically now that i think about it one of the trades was a scalp and i risked maybe five dollars right, we can see anyways we'll get into it so that actually excuses the numbers a bit um because technically i risked uh my usual what? what is that? I'm looking at it right now. I want to say like the fifth of the risk on a scalp that I usually do. Man, I shouldn't even fucking scalp. I feel like that's like stupid. Not stupid, but kind of like takes away from my system. Wow, I'm just having this revelation, revelation now. I'm gonna fucking take out this fucking scalp bullshit, bro. Always have a plan set. I've always, whenever I take a loss, it's because I don't have a fucking plan set. I get into a trade just because I get into it. I don't have like a fucking idea, of ideas or scenarios. It's, it makes sense for me to have my ideas and possible scenarios plotted out before I even start, before the market even opens. I mean, shit, I didn't even do that today, to be honest. <laughs> I didn't plan on trade. The thing is, you shouldn't plan on trading without the, the setup, without any idea. Because it's then like, what the fuck are you doing? But again, it's like, um, if you can come in, make a trade based off what you see, you've got to be like some sort of fucking um, professional. Like you've had to have seen XYZ for XYZ times, years. Fuck, does that make sense? Fuck, I don't know. Ultimately, have a plan set, have possible ideas that could happen and don't be like biased. I think that's a big thing. So you got to be able to um, react and not predict. And then of course follow the follow the big banks, follow the big moves. Because even though um because why? Because it's hard to time the market. No one fucking can. Really, like, even if you're uh, an insider. Uh, it, it depends, man, I think. Like, it's tough to time the market. What do they say? They say timing the market is better than timing the market. But shit, here I am trying to fucking time the market. Not really. Um really it should be about playing probability as a trader. That's what I have. It's like, that's what I want to do. It's see a hand in the market. Like poker, see a good hand. I want to see like ace king, ace jack, ace queen. Fucking see that setup, play that setup. Um, but yeah. So ideally, when I see a range bound price, fuck. After a strong push in price in any direction, there's usually like a range bound price. It doesn't always create a downward or upward channel, but this channel has high probability of ping pong trades. For example, this, we see a strong uptrend and then we channel down and then we break back up. And I'm thinking of taking these trades about here, 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 here. Maybe not the first here, here, but like here and here. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a downward channel, upward channel, like I'm saying earlier, right? It can be just a straight channel, range down price. And I feel like that's high probability because buyers and sellers are trying to figure out, is price fair? Is the strong rally valid? No, then price can simply sweep back down. Yes, then price can simply keep going up. These both happen, both ideas of price coming back down or going back up happens because liquidity is built up. There's a lot of orders filled and also technically a lot of orders created um, when structure like this occurs. Because yes, there's buyers here, but they also have their sell stops. There's sellers here, but they have their buy stops, right? So there's liquidity on both sides being built um, naturally, organically, as people try to decide if price is fair at this level. Like, let's say this level is like 25, right? People are deciding, is 25 good? And what happens here is that we come all the way back down that buyers, buyers are like, hell yeah, this price, I'm gonna, hell yeah, 25 is good. I'm gonna keep buying, and we break out. That's what happens. The buying pressure becomes too great to the selling pressure, and they get swept out, these sellers swept, these sellers swept, these sellers swept, boom, boom, boom. Even probably some of the fucking buyers got swept here. Like these buyers might've got swept here, and their sell stop becomes buys. And then boom, 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 boom. Price comes to like 30. Price needs to come, needs to go from balanced areas such as this to imbalanced areas such as like a fly, a flying soaring uptrend, not uptrend, but up, up push, and vice versa. That's what's reflected on charts that we see. Like we could even look at live. It's like, okay, we balanced after a strong press down. After balancing, we're gonna keep going down and find more. We're gonna find another area to build up orders because we already balanced here. This is not a fair price for buyers or sellers anymore because we filled up orders. So we're gonna press down. We're gonna find more buyers, and we're finding buyers are balancing. We're kind of like uptrending right now, but. It's funny, we're in a fucking balanced area because we're 
not where we're in the middle, but not where most of the action has been. Like you look at the volume profile here, uh, a lot of actions, a lot of orders have been filled around here. Probably a lot of fucking buys here in this fucking candle. But anyways, I say ping ponging price is easier after these strong rallies and dumps, and it definitely helps to be at a higher time frame point of interest as well as having high volatility. So Friday was just fucking great because we see we've rallied or we've dumped for the last couple of days into a strong flip zone. I call these flip zones because it's like formerly resistance and then it becomes a demand and now we're coming, coming back and testing. I don't want to exactly. And um, there's a time where I used to fucking go and try and buy this zone, but see it as like a demand zone, but it's really a flip zone somewhere that we'll at least be interested in and not exactly buy. So we're at this zone and um, then what, right? We're also high volatility, right? Because of all the fucking shelling, shelling that's been going on. Um, yeah, what I like to do personally is go for one to two and a half. And that means I have to win at least 20, 29% to just break even. Any profit, any percent greater, Result in profit. And I feel like my strategy and system has a greater probability than 29%. After the fact, I, I realized that like, ideally I can tighten my stop loss to where the idea dies or changes and target the other bound to the range. So for example, I might be able to pull it up on the other one. But here's here's 8.30, right? We're at the zone we've reached. I think it's better to show here. At the 8.30 market open, I risk 10 points. I can risk 10 points for 45. Uh, I believe, let's have a better look, right? So here is our 8.30. What I was thinking is this, uh, ch -ch -ch. I saw, to be more precise, this range build from overnight. So we have a top here, and we have like a bottom here. So the breach of this, I would risk more or less 10 points of the breach and aim for this high, which is about 45. That's what I'm talking about, right? <sighs> that's like an ideal setup, but that's not exactly what happened on Friday. So again, key components are a strong rally or a dump into a higher time frame point of, point of interest with high volatility while we're waiting, while waiting, watching for liquidity to build up through structures. And for me, the structure again is just like this range that's being built after the dump. And I'm kind of like extending the range. Like you can see, like I extended it out to encapsulate this and this. So after the 8:30, I pull my range down. And what? I maybe could have caught this move here. At the least, note that this here was a nice zone, not a zone, but a point of interest. We break up, we rally through it. We see this pin bar, which should be an indication that buyers and sellers do not agree. Um, which is not indicative, but like yeah, I'd say indicative of a imbalance. So there's an imbalance, seller imbalance, and then we sort of, uh, what's the word? See some indecision in this next candle. It's kind of like, uh, I don't know how to fucking, I don't want to say spinning top. The spinning top's usually like at the top here, but um, a bit of indecision after this, and then we dump. I say closing below this is a signal like, hey, get in short, target the fucking lows here, or at least the middle here, and that worked out as well. But the first trade I took was actually this, down here, we breached. I remember, oh man, I want to like pick up the fucking commentary I had in the uh, Friday session, but we pricked down, we poked down, and even before that, I was like trying to set up my buy. Initially, I set it up, I believe, on this wick, and then I was like, well, technically, these are better buys. There's people sitting here, so I want to be below them. I want to be, ideally, not first, and maybe second, maybe third. And what I mean by that is like my entry. I don't want to be stopped out um, because it's all you can get. You can guess the right move, but if you're wrong, or no, if you're late or early, you're still wrong. Like you can get stopped out, and it could go the way that you intended, but you got stopped out. You're wrong. Like that's something that took me a, a while to realize. Like if you get stopped out, that's still your fault. Like you had a bad entry. And it happens too, like it's, which is okay. So to, for me to want to prevent that, I have to get a better entry. Because I've always, not always, but there are plenty of times where I not predicted the move, but like saw a scenario and intended to play it. Like for example, like even this, like I see that the range is going to be played. So I want to come in and get the best possible entry. I don't think even entering off this wake was the best entry. I could have maybe had a little give, a little, uh, could have gave, not gave up, but like get a deeper entry, like maybe, I don't know, 17. So 14, 6, 17. I think the low here was like, what, 16, not 16, 14, 6, 15 ish. Um, but yeah, I mean, what am I even saying, bro? Who is, who is he talking to? But, um, yeah, we, that was the idea, just kind of play this range that developed, and I targeted the middle, because, like, even though, ideally, this is the target, I want to take off here, because for one, it was my one to two and a half, and, and what? <laughs> I took off there because it was high probability, right? Price here in the middle shouldn't be a place to enter trades, but to exit trades, because it's, Everyone else is trying to enter. They're late. Fuck them over. No, not fuck them over, but don't be that guy to enter in the middle of a range. Because probability of your trade going right or wrong is lower than if you were playing the range. If you're playing the bottom here, there's typically a higher chance of price coming back up than if you were right in the middle. But yeah, you could maybe have found this, this buy here. But is it a better probability than finding the buy down here? No. When well, there's so much action to the left, price can clear and swipe through these areas easily because price moves like a magnet. It goes to find unfilled orders. For example, all this action built up after the 830 tells you don't fucking, don't be foolish, don't enter around here. Because your risk to reward is skewed. Your probability of whatever direction you're predicting is lower than if you were to do it up here or down here. And as you can see, price also zipped through the zone and what? 
quarter as many candles here than over here. This is something I'm really trying to train myself on is selling when you see selling on green candles and buying on red candles. Sort of being contrarian because you want to enter on a retracement. You don't want to enter as the move is going because that skews your risk to reward. Simply, you want to be a second entry. And since every moment in the market is unique, ideas can die and they can change or they can change. No, and. Or they can change. The biggest mistake I made this day was trying to scout myself back into a long position because of greed, FOMO, and you know, fear of leaving money off the table. Uh, man, I'm so disappointed in myself. This little trade that I had here in the middle, I was trying to basically re-enter. Um, it's okay. Yeah, the second trade I'm not proud of. I was trying to re-enter. If anything, I could have maybe re-entered. I should have re-entered down here. Um, but I did. I did this trade because I was fucking greedy. I wanted to keep my foot in the trade until the ultimate idea of price coming back to the top of the range. So that was greed. There was also FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. Fear of missing out on this idea that would happen, and it did happen. And of course, fear of leaving money on the table. And I gotta remember these things. I gotta remember these solutions. After a good day, after a good trade, I should leave the computer. Just fucking leave. It's over. The day's done. Especially on a win. Um, maybe. That's an idea. That's a solution, potentially. But um, I should also reassess price action. Develop new ideas, because the one that I had, like this down here, is now done. Technically, that trade cannot happen again. Right? Even though, like, a re-entry can happen, that is not the same as this trade that happened. <clears throat> Technically, I have, if I put in the same trade, it works out, but it's not the same idea. It's not the same. Uh, it is the same concept of, like, grabbing this liquidity, but now it's different levels. We have more action to see whether or not the idea works and really this should have been um, a trade because we built even more liquidity to this to get to get price to sweep like how clean of this i feel like a trade idea is correct solidly correct when you see a strong move happen right after so like this strong press up indicates that this was a good buy all this liquidity built up which was part of this which happened after this press down which happened after this build up it's like the fuck are you doing it's trying to scalp here reg what are you doing idiotic silly silliness but it's okay um, we also, we, I also had this idea, like, next time considering two take profits, with one at the middle, or one at the two and a half risks, uh, two and a half rewards, whatever the fuck, and then, um, another one for the other bound of the range. So I could do two things. I could probably do different things, be more creative, but the idea is to have two contracts, one with a smaller SL, or bigger risk. So, for example, at this, I would have risked six points with two contracts, which is still 12. Or I'm risk, I can risk, um, 12 points with the two, which makes it, uh, two risks. And then if I take off the one contract at uh, two and a half in the middle, it's still... A positive trade, I'm still up half a risk if uh, the stop loss gets hit. I'll definitely consider that, but I just think that I should be consistent. Ideally, I, I should keep the take profit and stop loss locked in and not move them until probably 20 plus trades of this same system. And then there, I should consider moving my take profit or using X amount of contracts, X amount of risk. For now, I just want to stay consistent. Like, a big key right now is making sure my risk management is top tier, fucking locked in. Like, always risking more or less 25 or 12 and a half points. And then comes this system that I'm building, you know, with an edge. I think there's clearly an edge in trying to trade uh, liquidity grabs, basically. This is, I would say, a liquidity grab. Um, range bound trading uh, and then that <laughs> comes everything else there's so much to trading there's so many obvious obvious videos obviously obvious there's so many things that traders talk about but i believe it should come down to first knowing your risk then building your edge and then everything else can come of course before even this i was working on you know my trading psychology that's definitely something like but i, build, I feel like you can build that while establishing your risk management or establishing your system but yeah now what my third trade um was kind of the opposite of the first in the sense that it was a short and not a buy probably try to find the clip but i was like seeing this liquidity build build up which is great it in indicates that sellers and buyers are trying to find they're trying to see who is really right they're filling all these orders right because we have this imbalance and i wanted to see it's funny i wanted to see a close below these wicks i thought we we're gonna get it on this long one but we didn't i thought we we're gonna get it on this one but we didn't so these wicks are telling all oh, buyers are still here so they're still trying i think you can tell that the wick yeah dude oh, fuck like i like the risk enough to where i was this is kind of like a lower probability because i didn't see the uh, candle closure below the, the wicks exactly. Like this is uh, not really a close, neither is this, it's just wicking down. But what I did like is that we pressed back up, we rallied back. Before this wicked, it was a strong rally and I was like, all right, fine, I'll take the risk. Of course, aim for the middle and uh, have a stop above here. And it just played out like, I didn't per se get lucky, but the idea was there and um, I like the risk. I like the risk. This was a, a fucking good hand to play because of course, as price does this or builds liquidity, it's gonna do one of two things. It's either gonna keep going up or it's gonna keep going down. And it kept going down. It's funny here that, you know, price didn't come back down here to these levels, so it's good that I don't have my take profit at the opposite side of the range just yet. Especially if you're dealing with just one contract. If I had another, maybe, but what? Like, let's say we had two contracts. One gets filled. One gets sold at two and a half hours. Right, still, technically, even though we're like... Yeah, still two and a half hours. Um, and then a loss makes it one and a half, and I'm still profitable. So yeah, maybe I will consider two fucking contracts, but we'll see. 